Hmm, there's something missing from my HF transmitter. Now, what could it be? Oh yeah, it's the RF preamp module. Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I'm not done working on my HF transmitter quite yet. There are issues with the RF preamp that I want to try to improve. Let's check it out. Here we go again. I'm revisiting the RF preamplifier in my home built HF transmitter. Now, without rehashing all the messy details, here's a quick summary. I started the project with two concepts. One used the classic 2N5109 BJT as the final output stage, and the other used a single IRF510 MOSFET. I built and tested both of them, and neither one met expectations for power output and distortion. And the 2N5109 ran excessively hot because I was driving it with a high amount of quiescent current to keep it in Class A mode. So I came up with a third design that uses a pair of 2N2222s in the last stage operating in Class AB, which promptly experienced thermal runaway. I came up with a really bodgy workaround to fix that problem, but ultimately I still have a preamp that comes up a bit short. I pulled the preamp out of the rig for some testing and of course for show and tell. And right away we can get a really good look at that hunk of aluminum that I fabbed into a heat sink and right here and right here are the two final transistors, the two N2222s that it, it's connected to. And of course this very stylish zip tie to hold the whole contraption together. I can definitely do better and specifically there are four areas that I want to try to do better from this design. And what I'm gonna do next is hook this up to DC power and some instrumentation so I can talk about those areas. The first area that I want to try to improve is the power output. And before I go through the setup here to show how I'm measuring power output, I thought it would make sense to revisit the design target. So let me put this slide on screen that shows an excerpt of the transmitter block diagram. By design, I want minus 12 dBm coming out of the bandpass filter feeding into the preamp which is then going to boost it to 27 dBm or a half a watt. That's a gain of 39 dB. And the bottom of this slide shows actual performance. Um, it's important to know, am I actually getting that minus 12 dBm going into the amp? And I have measured that off camera. So the bottom right-hand corner shows minus 12.2, minus 12.3, and minus 9.9. I'm actually overperforming a bit on 15 meters. So I definitely have adequate power going into the amp. But look on the left, I don't have adequate power coming out. 23.4 on 40, 21.7 on 20, and 20.4 on 15. I do expect the power to drop down a bit as they go higher in frequency, but even 23.4 is not enough to drive my final amplifier. So I need to do something here. I'm coming up short. Let me show you really quick, since I have the setup here, uh, an easy way to measure the output power. Obviously I have to have DC power coming from the power supply to the amp. I've got a 50 ohm dummy load with a 10 times scope probe connected across it going to the signal in the background. Signal generator right here, you can barely see it on the left of the screen. That's going to provide my minus 12 dBm input. And as an extra measure, I've inserted the 40 meter, since I've got the signal generator set to 7.15 megahertz, I've inserted the 40 meter low pass filter from the rig here. That's just to knock down any of the spurs that are coming from the signal generator. It's very clean to begin with, but putting this filter there makes it even cleaner. It's not that critical for just a rough power measurement, but in a moment, the next thing I'm going to talk about is distortion, and it is almost mandatory to knock those spurs down as much as possible. So I just happen to have this here for that distortion measurement later. So let me connect the power. And I'll turn on the RF, and we can see it right there, minus 12 dBm. Hopefully it's coming through on camera, and you can see a sinusoid looking output on the scope in the background. And the usual math is you can either take the peak value or the RMS value, use the appropriate formula. I know there's 50 ohms here. Do the math, I can figure out what the power is very simply, and that's what I did here. The second parameter that I mentioned that I want to improve is distortion. So I've changed the setup here. I've got my tiny SA connected to the amplifier output through my step attenuator, which is set to 30 dB 
of attenuation. And now it's very important that I have this low pass filter here, as I mentioned, to knock down any spurs that might be coming from the signal generator, which is now off screen. So still at minus 12 dBm input, I can turn it on and we can see the screen of the SA light up with all these hmm, disturbing looking spurs everywhere. And what I've done is done a uh, screen capture and put it on a slide so I can talk about it more easily rather than trying to focus on this tiny SA screen. So there's two images here. The first one on the left is just, just to show how clean my input signal. So before I recorded this, I connected the output of the signal generator through that low pass filter to the tiny SA. And you can see the signal's very clean. The first harmonic is 60 dB below the carrier and the higher harmonics are even lower. So that's definitely adequate for doing this distortion measurement. And the image on the right is the output with all of its distortion spurs. The fundamental is at minus 6.6 .6 dBm. If you add back that 30 dB of attenuation, it's really at 23.4 dBm, which puts the overall gain just under 36 dB. So that's consistent with the rough measurement I did a moment ago with the scope. But look at all those harmonics. Um, because I have all these harmonics now on the output, and I know I don't have them on the input, I'm clearly driving the amp into some gain compression. And off camera, I've verified that by slightly decreasing the drive, like you know, 2 dB at a time, and watch those harmonics drop off very quickly. Um, the biggest harmonic, the second harmonic, is only 25 dB below the carrier. So this is not good as it is, uh, and for sure if I try to eke some more power out of this design, well I certainly can't drive it harder, I'm just going to make the distortion even worse, and I'm not that confident that I could even make some minor adjustments elsewhere in the design and really get that much more power without still suffering this distortion. The third item is I need a better input impedance match. Now the target of course is 50 ohms. That's what my upstream bandpass filters expect in terms of an impedance load attached to them. But here's what I've got shown three different ways. First is simulation and unfortunately it doesn't predict very good results here. Around 30 ohms and it is flat but 30 ohms is still 30 ohms. That's off of where I need it to be. The better set of data to judge the existing version of the amplifier is actual measurements and I've used my nano VNA to quantify it and it does show that it starts out under 30 ohms very similarly to the simulation but it also uh, measures it increasing slowly with frequency. Now the best way to look at that same data would be to plot it on a Smith chart. Now it doesn't make it look any better, it just makes it look more standardized and it's not good. It's off of where it would need to be. You know, the best uh, looking Smith chart for input impedance would be a single dot right at the very center and that's of course the ideal, but I'm nowhere near that. Fortunately I think I can definitely do better with the next round of design. And of course the fourth area is thermal management. This heat sink that I came up with was just a quick fix to get the amplifier working. And more significantly it just wasn't wise in hindsight to be pushing these 2N2222 so hard. You know I went and rechecked my spice simulation and they're dissipating or handling about 700 milliwatts a piece continuously at peak drive so not so good. So whatever I do next, I want to have more robust thermal management and I'm going to raise the bar on the requirement here for the output. I really want to get to at least one watt by design output or 30 dBm for a couple reasons. Um, my simulations tend to run overly optimistic so I need to put a little extra headroom in there and secondly there's just more losses than I have anticipated in the overall chain so having a little extra headroom there will be good. That's also going to push <laughs> the need for better thermal management. And then lastly as far as thermal management goes this um, packaging of the bias diode here was another quick workaround. I learned the hard way that you can't put the diode you know, remotely over here when the heat is over there. Uh, that causes a, a big risk for thermal runaway in a push-pull amplifier so I need to make sure I'm trying to get that diode as closely coupled to the heat being generated by the transistors and maybe do a prettier and more elegant job of doing that. Fortunately, all of these changes that, that I need to do are incremental. They're not major changes, so I think I stand a really good chance of getting it right finally in this next attempt. I still think this architecture is fundamentally sound. 
And by that, I mean using a couple of BJTs in Class A operation that are then followed by a pair working in Class AB to pump up the current does seem appropriate. And it really shouldn't be that hard to boost minus 12 dBm to plus 30 dBm in three stages. That's only 14 dB per stage if it were shared evenly. But I think I am asking too much of the SOT23 size 3904s and the TO92 size 2N2222s here. Fortunately, I've just recently completed a search for medium power SMT transistors, specifically for ones that could fill the void left by all the obsoleted TO39s like the 2N5109, 2N2218 and 19, and a bunch of others. Short story, I have yet to find one that matches the specs of any one of those oldies, but I was able to find a few that might just be good enough to use in this RF preamp. My search and testing concluded that the DXT2222A, the 2SCR513, and the 2SC5994 are viable candidates. And of these three, I think the DXT2222A aligns the best here. Its power dissipation is the lowest of the three, but I think it is still sufficient for this application. Okay, so here's version number four, revision C. Now I'm only gonna discuss the highlights here because I posted much more detail on the assumptions and calculations behind this design on my blog. And I'll show the link below in this video and also put some more details including that link in the video description. I did study Ashar's J-Bot amplifier. I studied Charlie Morris's latest version of it. Uh, I studied Manfred's very detailed info on push-pull amplifiers and of course lots of EMRFD references. So I'll put links to most of that stuff in um, my video description as well. So let's get right to the, the changes here. Uh, up at the power end, I added a P-channel MOSFET for power control, and that'll work the same as my final amp. It'll only be conducting uh, when it gets a signal sent by the Arduino during transmit. And that'll save all these stages from having any heat dissipation when I'm not actively transmitting. I replaced the two MMBT3904s and the two 2N2222s with the DXT2222A in all four locations. Now, one thing that I didn't mention earlier about this particular choice of transistor is I'm pretty sure it's just a 2N2222 repackaged in a SOT89, which is just fine. I just needed an appropriate transistor, and that one stuck out in my evaluations. All right, now uh, all three stages now have emitter degeneration and all three have uh, collector to base feedback. Um, I've tweaked the number of turns in all three interstage transformers. The first one is now trifilar. And then of course, lots of tweaks to the exact values for all the bias, feedback, and other uh, resistors in the circuit, all with the goal of trying to optimize the interstage impedances, the input impedance, and get the overall gain. Uh, to where I want to be. And I'll show those assumptions and resulting calculations on that blog page. Now I did mention this is revision C. There were revisions A and revisions B of this design that were basically incremental steps just to get to where I am now. Um, and lastly, uh, as far as gain goes. So the calculated gain for the first stage is 11 dB. For the second stage is uh, 14 dB. And the third stage, the push-pull stage, is the most. It's 18 dB, giving me a total gain of 43. And those calcs are based on the formulas in EMRFD, and they typically are within a dB or so of what you actually end up with. Let's look now at some LT SPI simulation results. Here I'm showing the magnitude of the S21 parameter, or the gain, and the magnitude of the input impedance. The blue curves are the older version, version 3, for comparison to the new version, version 4C, shown in orange. The simulation predicts a 4 to 6 dB boost in gain across the board, with the gain roll-off with frequency staying about the same. Regarding the input impedance, the simulation is predicting a significant improvement here. The older version was stuck at just under 30 ohms, but now I'm much closer to 50 ohms, especially in the 40 meter band, which is my favorite HF band. The third and final simulation is gain compression, and there's more good news here. The dashed lines show the results for version 3, and the solid lines are the new version. Each version has three sets of plots, one each for 7, 14, and 21 MHz. 
And again, there's a solid improvement shown in gain across the board here, plus there's also no onset of gain compression. At 7 MHz, it's barely starting to show some roll-off, but it's not quite yet down a full dB, even at minus 9 dBm of drive. So that's good. My new design should have adequate headroom to accommodate the input power without getting into unacceptable distortion. So with good simulation results, I proceeded to lay out the board, and here it is. It's 15 millimeters wider than version number 3, 57 versus 42. The length is the same at 73 millimeters, and so is the mounting hole pattern, so it will drop right into my transmitter. I did have to remove one of the four mounting screws. I needed that extra space, but no worries, three screws are still fine for holding the board in place. Notice I'm using the heatsink pads that I created for my transistor study project. Now they do gobble up a fair amount of the area, and so do the three transformers. And wherever a resistor is dissipating more than 100 milliwatts or so, I'm using a through hole instead of surface mount. Transformer T1 gets mounted to the top surface, but I stuck the other two transformers on the bottom because I needed the space for R15 and R16. All three transformers will use FT50-43 ferrite cores. Also notice diode D1. Now this is the diode that sets the idle current for the two output transistors and it's the diode that caused me all the thermal runaway problems back in episode number 17. So what I've done here is position it directly above a small tab of copper foil that extends out from the heatsink pad. Placing it there with a dab of thermal compound should connect it thermally with Q5 and keep me out of thermal runaway problems. Lastly, notice that I put transistor Q5 on the bottom copper layer. I did that for two reasons, the main one being it gives cleaner trace routing to transformers T2 and T3, and the other reason is I'm using both the bottom and top copper layers for routing signals and power. So what about a ground plane? Well, I'm going to go upscale here. This will be a four layer board with the two middle layers being ground planes. Next step, of course, is to order the boards which takes several weeks, and that gives me some time to work on a few other things here in the lab. It also gives you guys some time to study the material that I've uploaded to my blog and ask me any questions or give me any feedback in case you have some suggestions for some adjustments. As always, I hope you're enjoying the content here on my channel, and I hope you are sticking with me still on this never-ending HF transmitter project. So until next time, bye for now.